just like the presidential decision in Indonesia isn't playing. The bell rings before one minute, the bell rings before two minutes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, to be honest, in fact, my interest in relation studies has just come up uh, quite recently. Um, it was in 2007, I was a visiting fellow at ICMAS, the institution of uh, Professor Rahman Mbong. And at the moment, I did a research on the relationship between the Muslims and non-Muslims in Kelantan. I conducted a field research in Kelantan for three months and another three months of library research at UKM. And previously, um, I had a job to translate a book entitled Challenging Authoritarianism in Southeast Asia, Comparing and Linking Indonesia and Malaysia, edited by Arya Brianto and Sumit Kumar Manda. And when I was at UPM, I checked that the Indonesian translation um, was much more frequently borrowed than the English one. I do not know why. Okay, um, so it was the two things which have prompted me, prompted me to have an interest in Malaysian studies, especially the links between um, the leftists of um, Malaysia, Malaya, and Indonesia. And uh, I put Sian in after Malay between the bracket because um, there's a confusion when we talk about Malay because um, uh, some ethnic groups in eastern part of Sumatra, um, they also claim themselves Malay. So I put Malay and then in the bracket scene, I it refers to Malay of the Malaysia. This paper is to show the links, the Malaysian and uh, uh, the Malaysian writers, the Malay, of Malaysian writers built with Indonesia and how this links affected and were affected by um, uh, the political relations between the two countries, especially during the confrontation. And, uh, Here are the recent questions of this paper. How were the modern Indonesia and Malayan culture, especially the networks built? Who took the initiatives of building the networks? Who traveled where? And what did they do in the neighboring country? And what had made such a network possible? How were these networks affected by and how did they affect the political dynamics in each country? So I would like to uh, show how literature and politics uh, were intertwined um, in the case of the Indonesia-Malaya relation in the crucial times, uh, especially during the confrontation era. Now, this is an early context of modern Malaya activities with Indonesia from 1930s to 1950s. Most of the points have been presented by Prof. Rahman and Bok, so I just would like to skip and to be honest that um, uh, most of the uh, narratives here uh, relied much on the book by uh, William Roth. The early stage, it was in the 1930s, a number of young Malay writers such as Harun Amidur Asif, Muhammad Yassin Mahmur and Abdullah Sita were intensively engaged with the works of the Pujangra Banu writers. And the seeds of the contact were laid down earlier, around the mid and many students of SITC already enjoyed Pali Pustaka's novels and other modern literature book for the college library. And the establishment of the Jabak Karamangana and the CIPC, which put Pali Pustaka as its model. And SITC is the site of where the Indonesian nationalist movement was promoted as the source of inspiration for change and progress among the Malay students. And it was um, inspiration for the formation of Lia Malaya led by Brian Yaakov in early 1930. Uh, it was an embryo for the formation of the first political organization among the Malaysians 
KMM. I think Prof. Rahman has mentioned a lot. And uh, the most important thing to know the initial context with the uh, Indonesian nationalists was that the term politics began to enter into the public discourse among the Malay intelligentsia, something phenomenal in the pre-war Malayan history. Prof. Rahman also mentioned because the reference was the same, Anthony Milner. <laughs> um, then, how politics then shaped the consciousness of the being a collective entity among the Malays was crucially visible in the rejection of the British colonial rulers' proposal of the Malayan Union in 1946. And to the Malays, this proposal did not promise independence and it gave much concession to the non Malays. Whereas by this time, they were witnessing the time of anti colonial mood in other parts of Asia, such as Indonesia, Indochina, and India. Even among the radical Malay nationalist fighters, as well as its veteran Saisa leaders, Indonesia was seen as the center of political power, capable of pioneering the national struggle for freedom of the entire archipelago from Western domination. And popular reaction against the Malaysian Malayan Union was the catalyst to the Malay nationalism. And according to the Malay elites, a political system offering a common citizenship and equal political rights for all who destroyed the Malay race. And the Malay Congress in 1946 um, led to the formation of AMNO, the primary organization of protecting and promoting the Malay interest. The conservative English-speaking traditional leaders, formerly supportive of British rule, now led the struggle against the Malayan Union and emerged as the undisputed leaders of Malay society as a whole. The radical and the leftist Malay nationalists initiating the nationalist movement in the 1930s were marginalized. They lost their momentum to enhance their own aspirations and the British agreed to abrogate the Malayan Union and invited AMNO to draft a plan for a more suitable constitutional arrangement. And in addition, British repressive measures against the leftists as a counter to the communist insurgency in the 1940s led to the leftists being expelled from the peninsula. Many moved to Singapore. And in the 1950s, Singapore became the center of an often highly politicized Malay artistic and literary scene. Uh, I'm just quoting the argument of uh, uh, Joel S. Khan. And one of the most the cultural events was the formation of Angkatan Sastrawan Lima Bulu. Uh, the association of the 1950 writers, or better known as Asas Lima Bulu. And the formation of the Asas Lima Bulu and its dynamics and links to Indonesia until 1957. Falling on August 6, 1950, at the home of a graduate of the SIPC, Muhammad Arif Ahmad, Asas Limapulu was the first literary association in post-war Malaya. And it represented the voice of the community, utilizing literature as the ideal thrust towards independence for Malaya. And its manifesto of Sastra untuk Masyarakat, Literature for Society, together with its pioneers, such as Ashraf, Resmas, Tongkat Ladan, or Usman Awang, Masuri SN, and Awani Sankam formed the main shaping force in the development of modern Malay literature. It was the logo of Angkatan Sastraman Lima Pulu. And the name Asas Lima Pulu initially emerged when Indonesian author Sultan Takdir Ali Sabana met with a number of Malay writers in Singapore prior to the formation of this association. When Sultan Takdir asked one of the members about the name of this would-be association, the leader said that they were Sastrawan Angkatan Lima Bulu, following Indonesia's Angkatan 1945, as they were impressed by the Indonesian Revolution and influenced by the works of the Angkatan 45. It was uh, the author of the Bujangka, Angkatan Bujangka Baru, Sultan Takdir Ali Shahbana, the fact that even in naming their organization, these writers followed the Indonesian model was no surprise since most of them had belonged to the Malayan Nationalist Party, reprising the wartime idea of a greater Indonesia. This party is an ambition independent Malaya as a part of Indonesia. Therefore, these writers kept looking at Indonesia as their primary reference 
while many of them build personal links with their Indonesian counterparts. And those belonging to Asas Limabul were fascinated by the dynamics of Western arts and culture through modern Indonesian literature. Indonesian writers were experimenting with ideas and expression while enhancing the Malay language, having been officially named Bahasa Indonesia, by exploring broader references of ideas, including Western ones. Usman and his fellow Malay writers used the works of Indonesian writers as a sort of university through which they modernized the Malay literature. The Asas Limabul writers consciously fostered Malay nationalism and promoted writing in Malay as an act of national expression. Moreover, says Samad Ismail, they wrote about poor people, laborers and peasants, and the struggle against poverty and the inequalities of landlordism. The Samad Ismail. Um, the manifesto of Asas Limabulu was much in parallel with that of Lekra, a lembaga kebudayaan rakyat or the Institute of People's Culture, uh, which had um, but a kind of informal links to the Indonesian Communist Party in the sense that they shared the idea of engaged literature or sastra terlibat. The term masyarakat here did not only refer to race, that is the Malays as a whole, but particular to class, that is the poor or the working class Malays. However, virtually, no sources mention that members of Asa Sinabru had close links with the members of Lekra. Yet, as the consequence of the ambush dominance in the Malay nationalist movement, the issue of national nationhood, which by then meant promoting the rights and privileges of the Malays in coexistence with the non-Malays, was more dominant rather than the issue of rakyatan or peoplehood in the sense of class perspective free of ethno-nationalism as promoted by the Malay and perhaps non-Malay leftist nationalists. This is what Prof. Rahman Ibong just mentioned um, what the historical residue of the history of the ideas. And the cultural and political agenda promoting Malayness was then dominating the nationalist discourse. One of the noteworthy outcomes of this sort of struggle in pre-independence Malaya was the introduction of the Roman spelling in Malay language as one of the important results of the Third Malay Language and Literary Congress but initiated by Asas Limabulu in 1956. And Malay nationalists, regardless of their ideological stance, still look to Indonesia as the model for the cultural framework of the would-be independent Malaya. What happened in Indonesia had its own resonance in Malaya. For example, the arts polemic between the members of Lekra and the signatories of Surat Kepercayaan Gilangan in 1950s had its echo in Malaya when the Manifesto of Asas Limabulu, which paralleled in Lekras, was challenged by the Art for the Art Sake Manifesto launched by Hamza former member of Asas Limabulu. And the AMLO's domination on the political and cultural stages and the internal conflict within Asas 50 later caused the activities of this association to decline around the mid-1950s despite its influence which was set to continue to reflect the Malay literary work in subsequent years. In addition, after the Malayan Federation gained its independence in 1957, um, I do not know whether the term king is correct or not. Um, the center of cultural activism moved back to Kuala Lumpur. Many Malay writers left Singapore for KL. Now under the ominous brand of Malay nationalism, Malay writer activists performed their work with a more nationalistic tone. And now the exchange of Malay and Indonesian writer activists began a confrontasi. The attainment of Malayan independence on 31st August 1957 was followed by the formation of the administratively untidy grouping uh, of the state settlements Pinang, Malacca, Singapore, the federated and unfederated Malay states and the diverse communities there. They came together in a moment of nationhood. And however, now quote Virginia Hooper arguments, true multiracialism was not achieved. None of the alliance partners Amno and its alliances from the non malay based political parties consistently represented the interests of their weaker constituents. And such a political configuration left a space 
for the leftist ideas to survive. Partly this was because the mood of the times was anti-imperialism. Even the 1960s through up an idealistic tang romantic generation of young Malay left-wing intellectuals who impressed the public with their selflessness and dedication to a worldwide cause to bring about political justice, equality, and a brief new world. I'm quoting um, the argument of Prof. Joachim. And many of the Malay leftists have been politically Indonesia oriented. Such a stand must have put them in trouble since independent Malaya was in search of its own national identity refusing to be the shadow and echo of other nations, including Indonesia. And ironically, especially as offered with Samad Ismail, it was such a Malay, Indonesia-oriented leftist nationalist who later played an important role in silently bridging non-formal diplomatic relations between Malaya, Malaysia, and Indonesia when Indonesia's campaign to crush Malaysia or Tanyang Malaysia for confrontation broke out. Sukarno's Kanyang Malaysia campaign, sponsor. Working outside official channels, Samad Ismail contacted leaders of several non aligned countries, Sukarno's Assume allies, and asked for the support for Malaysia. Through Adamale and other contacts in Indonesia, he also learned and passed along to worried Malaysian leaders the news that Sukarno lacked support among significant elements of the Indonesian power structure for his assault on Malaysia. Picture of Adamali. When Sukarno was overthrown in 1965, confrontation was immediately abandoned by Indonesia's new military rulers under General Suharto. As the hidden bridge between the two countries had been laid down by Samak Ismail, the normalization of the diplomatic relation of the two countries was just a matter of time. And Samak's case shows a paradox. His leftist nationalist stance and close links with Indonesia had put him in trouble in the context of the nation-building nation -building project of the newly independent Malaya. However, in a time of crisis during the confrontation, it was such a stance that made him play an important role in keeping contacts and building a silent diplomatic channel with Indonesia, so that the relationship between the two countries was a trap in total hostility. On the other hand, the presence of a number of non-leftists or even anti-leftist Indonesian writers in Malaya in the early 1960s, such as Balfa, Sultan Taktid Ali Salbana and Mokhtar Lubis, due to the dominance of late class politics of authorship and to the PTI's close link to Sukarno, maintained the canceling of Malaya Indonesia. They associated well with Malay writers. Okay. Even the two directional traffic of writer activists between Malaysia and Indonesia at times of crisis, writers could play an important role in bridging the political tension of the two countries. Writers could represent a sort of alternative image of their home country. Such an exchange of ideologically marginalized writers at times of crisis was only possible when the cultural traffic and links of the two countries had long historical precedent, which can be traced back to the mid-1920s. In the case of Malaya, Indonesia, also rings and traffic from 1920s to 1965, one might say that initially it was through literature that political influences were transmitted from Indonesia to Malaya. And finally, that it was by the writer activists of the two countries that political tension between the two countries was partly resolved. Thank you. Alsantara uh, exchange. Now, uh, his lecture actually points to something very interesting. In the early 50s, you have this exchange between the Malay literary uh, intellectuals in Malaya and Indonesia. Today, that's not natural. <coughs> if, if the Malay literacy, uh, sorry, if Indonesia was a threat, then uh, to the other leadership in Malaya, today Indonesia is a threat representing pluralism. And that's why you have Indonesian Bible being banned. And not just that, you actually have uh, the Indonesian translations of Charles Darwin's The Original Species being banned in Malaysia since 2006. 
So the same hope you can get in English in Malaya, as I mentioned today, but not in Indonesia. Because Indonesia is a trap. Now that just gives us a very good transition to Professor Nasna, uh, who is now uh, an associate, uh, associate professor at the Department of Malay Studies and Science Asian Studies as N at NUS. Uh, she has written uh, extensively on gender, ethnic, and Islamic studies. Uh, so, and she would now lead us to look at the relationship between Islamic state and community and law. Professor. Yes, uh, thank you, organizers, for inviting me here. Uh, I don't know whether my topic goes under the rubric of uh, ideas and thoughts, but I think uh, you could try to make a connection uh, while, while I go through uh, my presentation. So Chinuat has introduced me uh, with my topic, which actually is going to be very large, of course, you know, from Corona Malaya to Global Malaysia, and of course I can't do it in 15 minutes, right? Uh, but, uh, yeah, uh, I'm showing out all these concepts so that we can sort of think of the context, the different context of how Islam uh, has evolved in uh, Malaysia. The reason why I would like to present this is I think is to give people an understanding of what is behind you know, some of the uh, Islamic you know, controversies uh, today. I think uh, what we need to know are uh, the agents you know, or the people behind the controversies. And going back uh, to history, uh, hopefully uh, we will be able to make uh, some of these uh, connections. Uh, I'm not sure whether we'll be revisiting or anything, but I think any form of revisit revisitation is really for the future. And uh, I hope that's what uh, I'll be doing uh, today. Yeah, uh, generally, uh, there are just a few slides for, to guide us in this presentation. I'd like to uh, basically throw out the idea about state, but in relation to community. Because what we have today is really the state. Whether it's in Singapore, or Malaysia, or the world at large, uh, it's always about states uh, defining and determining our lives. And, and that's something that none of us can get away from, despite all these uh, migration, mobilities, transnationalism, internet connection, which is supposed to be borderless, but the state is still at the center uh, of our lives. So, uh, Islam, so if we put uh, this, the whole issue of Islam uh, within this context, uh, what we should understand really, when um, during the olden time, what Professor Rahman has spoken about, about that whole uh, Malay world which is supposed to be fluid, borderless, uh, uh, actually having Karajaan, well Karajaan is actually a form of state, but I'd still like to uh, defer a bit in the, our conception of societies at that time, because much as the sultans or the Malay rulers were strong in all of these places, actually the day-to-day -day interaction uh, is the most uh, powerful for people. And, and I think uh, Professor Rahman did pick up what Milner spoke about, the face-to-face -face interaction and that could actually only be done within a very small uh, locale. And that locale is of course your village, for the Malays and for people in Southeast Asia, and perhaps more, the most that they can imagine will be this idea okay, of community. Village is, you actually know every member of the village, but community is probably uh, intra inter-village kind of uh, connection. So that was how Islam was at that level. Uh, I think, uh, and when the British first came to what uh, was Malaya, um, that was what they confronted with Islam, although the Kerajaan had Islam as a very important um, kind of ideology or, or, or to strengthen their power, but at the day-to-day -day level, Islam was still uh, very much the domain of uh, religious um, uh, teachers. Uh, they have small groups, uh, or what we call the tarikat now, and they organize everything at the village level. About the only uh, important, perhaps, uh, functionary at that time would be the Kadi, who would solemnize uh, marriages and divorces among Malays. But everything else, I think you can imagine those days, uh, would be uh, a bit of a mixture of Adat and what, what they understand as religion, and the ritual is Islam. Uh, and, and the Sultan, although they have some laws uh, governing all this, but I don't think that the power of enforcement is as wide and as strong 
as we would uh, see, or, uh, what we see, of what the state is capable of doing uh, today. So the other concept is about decentralization to centralization. Uh, that's an important thing to throw out also, I think, when we look at the past uh, in Malaya and looking at the global relationship today. Uh, it was very decentralized, actually. Uh, even after the British came, uh, Islam was decentralized because it was under the powers of the different uh, Malay rulers. Uh, today, in law, although we have Islam, it's supposed to be at the state level, but you know that the centralization of the federal government is very, very strong okay, on uh, Islam uh, itself. Okay, then, uh, uh, just to relate to my topic about lawmaking, uh, there, there is an evolution. Nothing is cast in stone. So even if you talk, if people say about Sharia, Islamic law, there is still an evolution. There is still a transformative uh, process that underpins okay, the changes in this law. So, so what I um, basically is Adat thing. Adat is a very loose thing. Uh, some people think of Adat as the opposite of Islam. Actually, it's not true because within Malay Adat, there's also an infusion of Islamic uh, practices and rituals. However, what is different, I think, now is that from something that's very loose, or what we call social norms, that has been kind of changed to something that's very fixed, has become a very fixed law. So Malay is today, of course, uh, as you know, some people are very much against Adat because they think that Adat is uh, anti-Islam, or they have elements of uh, un-Islamic uh, practices there. Uh, and, and everything is fixed in law, Jaki, which is the uh, Department of Religious Development in Malaysia, uh, will actually define what is the correct Islam. And you know that it's not just non-Muslims who get uh, uh, prosecuted and persecuted okay, uh, under Jaki's hands, but also uh, Muslims who do not actually practice okay, the correct Islam according to the Malaysian uh, government's idea of Islam. So the Shias are actually illegal, they're not supposed to practice, the Ahmadiyyas are uh, also, you know, a kind of a deviant group. So, so they, they have a law. And the reason why they can go and uh, do what they do is because there are laws to justify the actions. Okay, the other uh, idea is this idea of a secular to a divine law. Actually, I would like to basically, in, in the next few slides, tell you that the origin of the Sharia law today is very, a very, there is a colonial uh, construction uh, behind it. Okay? So it was, not, it was supposed to be secular in a sense. It, does not, it doesn't mean that religious laws are not secular. It means a religious law, or, or it could be law that is just imposed on people of a religious belief. So whether the law is divine or not, that's a big question mark. Okay, but whatever it is, there is this uh, conception that uh, Sharia is now a divine law and something that cannot uh, be changed. That is also, I think, a misrepresentation. So before colonialism, but these are, this is some of the uh, uh, laws that exist. It is not a lawless society, Kedah Kerajaan, but there are all kinds of laws, like 99 laws of Para, there's Amina Kabau Digest, Johor also has got its own law, Kedah has got its own law, Malacca Digest. Now, mind you, these are everything that's been collected by colonial uh, scholars. Okay, They kind of label all these laws, uh, they give the names to these laws. Um, and and, and uh, some of the 99 laws of Para, some are Islamic, some are not. Okay, uh, Minakabo uh, Digest have laws which only allows the uh, women to inherit land. Okay, and that's not uh, present in Islamic uh, law of inheritance today. So, do, 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 do they, did the British come to say that the, the Malays were uh, non-Muslims? Of course not. They were all uh, uh, practicing Islam okay, at that time. That was the understanding. So, uh, just to give you an academic concept, anyway. This Khan was a historian who worked uh, in India, and he also uh, actually found the same thing. So everything that existed pre-colonial or even during colonial time was not a fixed written code, but an interpretation of prolix or an ever-changing living law. So everything was supposed to be living, and everything was supposed to be uh, kind of uh, evolved according to the needs and interests of society at that time. Okay, how? What is the origin now of uh, British intervention? Uh, in Islam, they are Islamic practices. I think we should go back to St uh, Raffles actually. In 1823, uh, he actually signed a treaty uh, with Sultan of Johor. Uh, this was in 1833. Uh, I just want to sort of highlight the uh, red uh, phrases here. In all, this is a treaty uh, because he was taking over Singapore. 
Right? All cases regarding the ceremonies of religion and marriages and the rules of inheritance, the laws and customs of the Malays will be respected. Okay? Where they shall not be contrary to reason, justice, or humanity. I mean, British legal language always like to put these uh, provisos, right? Not contrary to reason, justice, or humanity. So everything else, yes, you respect okay? for the Malays uh, practicing. In all other cases, the laws of British authority will be enforced with due consideration to the usages and habits of the people. I mean, very clever kind of legal trickery, I think, because it actually protects the British against everything. Uh, there they are, you know, getting this piece of island you know, from Singapore. <laughs> this is cut the long story short, but it is more complex than that. And, and, they, and, and so they've got the Malay rulers to agree that we will not touch any of what's sacred to you, uh, but in all other cases, uh, we will uh, take care of. Okay, so the, the whole idea of habits, usages of, of the people, I don't know. But they are, but uh, they did it. Then, uh, when it came to Malaya, that was in 1874, uh, quite a few years uh, after that, 50 years, that was when the British came into Malaya itself. The earlier one was to Singapore to, to establish a strict settlement. But you notice that the wording now is more uh, exact. Like Raffles uh, Treaty was slightly more uh, ambiguous in some ways. It is legal, but still ambiguous. Now this is very very serious because the British actually got the Sultan to agree uh, to uh, put, um, the Sultan will receive and provide suitable residence and so on and so forth and whose advice must be asked and acted upon on all questions other than those touching Malay religion and custom. So I think a lot of historians uh, like to kind of ponder about this, whose advice must be asked and acted upon on all questions. <laughs> uh, this basically of course, uh, now Amno said Malaya was never colonized because the Sultan was actually the ruler. Okay, but if you read this kind of treaty, of course, all the sovereignty okay, of the Malay ruler was actually transferred to the British because everything must be asked and acted upon, okay? except those touching Malay religion and custom. Now, actually, mind you, um, even under um, Malay uh, Islamic laws, uh, the British sat on all the uh, meetings. Uh, during which the Sultan wanted to pass laws on Islam. So it wasn't like the Sultan and his council of Malay uh, advisors uh, established the laws without the British. The British were always there, even if it was on Islam. Uh, so the, uh, this, uh, this is the, again a British uh, uh, classification of indigenous laws. They have Adat Papate. Actually, this is all a classification. Okay? But a lot of uh, scholars or people who study Malay history as though well, this is the real thing in Malay life. There's Adat Kapate, which is supposed to be more matrilineal. There's Adat Tamangong, which is supposed to be matrilineal. And then there's uh, what is called, they never use the term shar Sharia these days. It's actually Shara. It's a Malay local term, Shara. Okay, Shara. And that's considered Islamic. So again, this is a very neat uh, categorization. It doesn't really work in real life. This is a British idea of that construction or that imagination of a community. Um, everything could be just hybrid and mixed. Okay, this is the first actually Islamic law that was passed in the Federated Malay States, uh, 1904. It's called Mohammedan Laws Enactment. Uh, this was one of the first uh, instances at which uh, the Sultan, you know, finally could actually impose it, uh, his power okay, upon people. And this is a punishment of certain offences by Mohammedans. Again, the term Muslims are not used. The British use the term Mohammedans following the Anglo Christian tradition. Okay, uh, Mohammedans was used. So these, these are offences, not attending Friday prayers, enticing an unmarried girl to run away. It's actually not in the Quran, but it is there. Anyway, because it's a local law. Uh, adultery, incest, cohabitation after divorce. Now, this is those who know Islamic law, uh, Muslims, when they divorce, they're given like a three-month period of Iddah where they're supposed to decide whether they really want the marriage to terminate. So if there's cohabitation after that divorce, it's uh, a kind of, well, after the divorce, and then it is it's already legalized, they cohabitate that same uh, offense. Breach of betrothal contract is an engagement. No, there's no law against that now, but it was. And so on and so forth, including this, these two are very important. Religious teaching without permission of the Sultan, printing of religious book without permission. Here is where the instance of the state coming in to affect religion. 
okay, is being seen. So basically, you're not supposed to do anything that's outside the Sultan's permission, and also they are afraid. Uh, they feel be threatened of any religious book without the permission of Sultan. So that really means there's a very plural kind of a situation okay, as far as Islam is concerned. Uh, uh, this, this one is just to show you uh, laws were even, you know the Malay Rulet Reservations enactment, trying to define what is a Malay, basically this is very interesting because the first legal definition of Malay is actually, it's not unrecognizable. Malay means a person belonging to any Malayan race who habitually speaks a Malay language or any Malay language and professes a Muslim religion. I think the, the thing that's debatable here is Malayan. What is a Malayan race? What is a Malayan language? Okay? Um, presumably it's Malay, but Malayan language actually those days would include Javanese, uh, uh, Boyanese, uh, all the different uh, sub ethnic groups. I just want to put this in because the British were quite uh, patronizing, they wanted to protect the Malays, and that's why they had the Malay Reservations enactment to prevent non Malays from buying certain land. So Winstead, for example, said, In my time, I did all I could to preserve Ada. Price of exports because with no Malay Reservation enactment was the only way to keep the Malay from selling his land to foreigners, Indians, and Chinese. Yeah, so that was this idea that the foreigners were threatening the you know, Malay because land was becoming very expensive at that time because they were open up, opening up land. Malays were selling on their lands. Uh, okay, resolving other and statutory laws. Here again, you have this uh, division Malay customary land rights. Some are not codified. Uh, the British set up this law called the Mohammedan Law and Malay Custom Determination Enactment. Now what does that mean is that it means that everything is fluid. So this law allows for the British to gather like uh, the uh, chiefs of the villagers, the khadis, the sultans to, to, to discuss. Is this Islamic? Is this not Islamic? Okay. So if the khadi says that it is, then they decide that it is Islamic. So that's why they have this law. Um, and then you have this emerging Sharia, which came much later. It actually was a mixed selection of Adat, the Sharia of the Shafi'i school, and the British statutory law. Well, that was the first uh, Sharia because they tried to they combined uh, everything. So post war, I'm going very fast now. Uh, there is of course globalizing, and uh, uh, we have from Mohammedan laws to Muslim laws. Okay, no more the term Mohammedan is not used anymore. We have Muslim laws. And so you have like laws, Muslim laws, enactment, state of the law. All the states also have it. This systematization of all laws for Muslims, new statute or administration of Muslim laws, everything is uh, nearing independence and independence, so there was more systematization of the laws. And Sharia court was of course recognized and upgraded. Before it was just a Kadi uh, court. Uh, however, okay, this is constitutionally uh, inserted that there will be plural laws for Muslims because there are 13 states, according to today, there are 13 states, which means that all the uh, states will pass their own Muslim laws. Uh, Islamic laws are not passed at the parliamentary level, only for the federal territory. So some, there's some variation in the different states of Islamic law. Nowadays, of course, uh, that's not the case, even though in name is plural, but you have the Prime Minister's Department, there's Putrajaya actually influencing all the states to make sure that they pass uh, uniform laws okay, for Islam. So the new laws for uh, Muslim 1990s onwards, not just in the name, you know, like Sharia as we use here, but you have so many laws. These are just a sample. You have the Sharia criminal offense, which is a separate law uh, from marriage law. You have a procedure, administration of Islamic religion, Islamic family law. How many minutes left? One minute? Oh my god. Wrapping up. Okay, so before uh, you can see that it's adult centered tribalism, state centered Kerajaan, which is still very loose. Uh, after it's Malay as political majority, I think we can get the idea. Islam, one of the many traditions in Malay because there was also adult. Uh, you have Malay strongly now, it's strongly anchored around Islam, community as family before, of course, and state as a sole determinant of correct uh, Islam. So, what uh, what is happening today? Let me just go. Who speaks for the Malay Muslim uh, today? Uh, just very quickly, before, if you recall, 1970s, 1980s, there were a lot of NGOs and civil society, Islamic civil society. This is during the colonial time, Kaum Muda versus Kaum Tua. Kaum Muda were the more reformist Islamists. They were actually against the southern type of Islam. 
That's why the Sultan had this law to say you're not allowed to publish anything on Islam except with his permission. It was the Kalmudah who were actually attacking their brand of Islam. Later in the 70s, they had Abim, okay, Angkatan Blaise from Malaysia, or al Ibrahim was one of the founders, as Jim, as Pass, who passed his political party. You notice that in, in the 80s, they were all actually anti government. And, and, and the Malaysian government actually tried to co opt all of these groups. Okay? Uh, in order to pacify uh, them. Now, today, who are the people uh, talking about Islam? I know the first uh, group that comes to mind is Bokasa Isma, right? <laughs> yeah, correct. They are actually religious bureaucrats. They are actually religious bureaucrats. If you look at the credential of the Isma, the head of Isma, he's actually a new star attached to some religious department. So his salary, yeah, he's all, they're all paid. Okay. Uh, sponsored NGO, of course, Bokasa is not all sponsored. And at the back of it all is really the federal government, Jakim, okay, of Putrajaya. Jakim is a huge uh, building in Putrajaya. Next to it is the Sharia court. Actually, they're not supposed to have uh, Islam in the federal government because in the constitution, Islam is actually the uh, purview of the state governments. Okay, I'm going to end now. So, conclusion, uh, so you could see that the colonial state uh, planted the seeds of uh, hybrid law and then you have the modern laws for Muslims and then current nation state you know that Sharia is used for strengthening a political majority so I think that's in short how I would say you know from colonial Malay to global I have not really talked about global Malaysia but you could see some tie-ins to globalization uh, how you know uh, Muslims actually think of them not just as Malaysian Muslims but also in the wider okay, transnational Muslim group, which is why the Gaza is really uh, conflict has become very uh, very much a Muslim uh, cause because they also identify with the larger uh, Muslim community. Thank you very much. I uh, can get to get together and organize an international conference like this outside the mainstream of. You know, centers of uh, the national centers of learning like the, the national universities my topic today is uh, really uh, in the area of historiography a uh, field of uh, for for historians to reflect on the writing of history the ideas involved in the writing of history and public reactions to aspects of history, including national history. Now, postmodernism theory and its methodology, deconstructionism, uh, it is driven by skepticism. Skepticism, questioning of core beliefs and, uh, and ideas, dominant ideas. Got it right. Okay. Now, do I turn left or right to make it move? All right. Okay. Thank you. Um. So, uh, where was that? Mm. The the team uh, revisiting there involves uh, deconstruction of the concept of Malaya. Um, even uh, leaving out Sabah and Sarawak and uh, focuses on the colonial experience and the post-colonial experience of the independent state and, <coughs> and uh, how it reflects on itself. So, um, but my emphasis is on how um, the uh, issue of uh, Malay's history, revisiting Malaya, uh, was debated in the last three or four years, from, nine, I would say, nine, uh, 2010 to 2013. How public, how the members of the public historians and scholars look back at Malaya's history, specific uh, topics of Malaya's history. <clears throat> now, just a little briefly on, on 
postmodernism is I don't want to be to make it appear too abstract. Postmodernism theory disputes the nature and construction of reality or truth in history. It denies the knowable reality of the past because it argues history cannot grasp reality and because of the slippery can you, can you move it slowly? One, one. Yeah. These are the themes that I uh, have my talk. Um, because we cannot grasp the reality, historical reality, because of the slippery nature of language, historians use language, uh, and history's linguistic turn makes history more than a little like literature. In other words, there's no difference between history and literature. Postmodernism theory makes no distinction between fact and fiction, between history and literature, and deconstructing history, the methodology, means more, much more than making diverse and alternate, alternative histories. It does not believe that you can recover truth in history. <clears throat> now, look, I would like to refer to the postmodern condition we are supposed to be in, according to postmodernists. Postmodern deconstructionism is a new way of looking at history. It is a form of critical thinking. It is also a critical theory or philosophy that changes or undermines the foundations of knowledge. Uh, it rejects the power of language-based knowledge to represent the real world accurately. It allows you to deconstruct whatever you are, whatever text you are studying or thinking. We now live in what is said to be a postmodern world, that is, the modern world that we have known is said to be changing or transforming itself and the world we live in now is perceiving itself a fundamentally different world today. That is, that we have gone beyond or past the area of modern modernism. Now, the postmodern condition. Many of you are having in your hands probably smartphones, iPhones. iPads, smart TVs at home, Androids, Blackberries. The latest radical advances in 3D printing technology may bring a radical change to our lives. For instance, in 3D printing manufacturing technology, you can build a full-size house, a gun, or a water pipe. <coughs> Due to rapid changes of mass communication technology, the occult or the supernatural beings have become people friendly. Vampires and monsters are acceptable. We see them on TV, on the cinema screen. Films glorify and romanticize vampires who are probably not regarded as blood suckers. Monsters are lovable creatures, not evil. <clears throat> Demons also are very friendly, unlike what they were 40, 50 years ago. Hollywood film animators have made the Gao Shrek friendly. In terms of virtual reality on your cinema or TV screen, people can walk on seas, fly or battle in the sky, or bicycle over sharp, rugged ice mountains like the Himalayas, or run or walk over flaming volcanoes and not get hurt at all. Those modernists are questioning core beliefs, traditions, and basic fundamental foundational knowledge of universal or absolute truths. Skepticism is so rampant that there is a direct questioning and challenging of basic knowledge and absolute truth. Ethical and moral values are being overturned. People are challenging and questioning issues relating to gender, sex, orientation, ethnicity, and religion. 
Conventional marriages between men and women are giving way to gay marriages, homosexuality, bisexuality, feminism, having children outside of that wedlock in some societies is now okay, acceptable, has become the norm. And in world perceptions of world, in world history, we had the former president of Iran, Professor, President Ahmadinejad, who went to the United Nations in 2011, he delivered a revolutionary speech, stating that the Holocaust, in which six million Jews were murdered by Hitler's Nazi regime, never happened. He challenged it, called the news. He shocked the world. <clears throat> Likewise, we, we have seen over, over several decades, Tokyo, the nine wartime uh, mil militaristic Japan's atrocities during World War II. And the Turkish government's denial of the massacre of one million Armenians during the World War I. <clears throat> so these are questions of core beliefs and truths. Modern postmodern critics deny that there's any such thing as historical truth or objectivity. The debate over history, truth and objectivity unleashed by postmodernism has become too widespread to be ignored. History is now under a severe and unprecedented attack. <clears throat> now I come briefly before I end to controversial issues in Malaysian history. The first, the issue of Han Tua, the bloggers and the internet. About two, about two or three years ago, the Malaysian public was confronted with the controversial issue of Hang Tua, the warrior. <coughs> and uh, it was said that the Malay warrior was a mythical. This was stated by actually the eminent uh, historian, Malaysian historian, emeritus professor Ku Ke Kim, of formerly of University of Malaya, who said that Han Tua was a mythical, not a historical figure. And he caused an uproar. Malay scholars were very upset because they all always thought that he was a historical uh, figure. <coughs> then, Professor Ku did it again. He said that Malaya was not colonized by the British. <coughs> Uh, this time he created a stir, public controversy because many parents, even school children, were wondering what they have been studying in the history textbooks all these years has uh, been false. Blair was not colonized. <coughs> Can you move on? Okay. All right, wait, wait, wait. please. Okay. So then. Uh, if, if this was were true, that it was the Malay rulers, he said that Malay rulers who invited the British to govern on their behalf, that it was the rulers who ruled and advised the British what to do, not the other way around. And then, of course this was, he received more brickbacks than support for this. And then there was the issue of the Malay novel interlock set in Malaya, a novel, you know, which was regarded by some critics as a historical account, not a work of fiction, that uh, it stirred up controversy because uh, it portrayed negative, negative uh, picture of Chinese and Indians. Chinese were portrayed as gamblers and the Indians as drunkards. So the reaction was more from uh, public, but some historians got involved in, in, in it. And even the, the Australian uh, historian, Professor Milner, who was then in Malaya, he said it was a good history textbook. A historical novel was regarded as a history textbook. This is an example of how postmodernists uh, regard uh, 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 work of uh, history as being equal to this historical novel. <clears throat> so for me, uh, we come to the fact that you know, if you say that Malay was not uh, 
when it was colonized, then uh, why every year we celebrate independence? And the controversy was finally settled because the Deputy Prime Minister Tan Sri Muhyiddin said that Malaya was colonized and that we do so. And that's why we celebrate independence. And this sort of quieted down the controversy so that, uh, that it, it, it sort of died down for a while. But I, I want to emphasize that this is what the postmodernist uh, controversy involved, questioning what has normally been regarded as a core, core belief, uh, a kind of accepted uh, 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 opinion. <clears throat> but uh, in fact, Professor Ku had made this statement in 19, in 2007, but it did not stir the kind of controversy that it did in 2010 and 2011. I will try and end this quickly by saying that um, uh, what, what you can you can get further from, uh, arguments and examples in my paper. I'll just conclude by saying that as I've shown, history depends very much on interpretation. We have to distinguish between acceptable, it's true, and, and unacceptable false interpretations. Fiction is unacceptable as history, in my view. If historians, of course, would insist that it all depends on evidence. If you gave your evidence that the sources, facts, events wrong, your interpretation will turn out to be unacceptable or distorted. We now have a postmodern engagement with the problem of historical truth. But then let's remember this. Any history is always someone else's history, told by someone from their par partial point of view, since no one can be certain that his or her explanation or interpretation is definitively right, all histories are also partial, provisional. None will have the last word. If we learn and accept this, we can live at peace with Malaya's, with Malaya's and Malaysia's alternative histories. Thank you.